Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Haikadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say with hearts full of joy and praise, Hallelujah. Well, friends, today is December 21st in the year of our Lord, 2017. And this is one a day for the soul. Now, if you can feel a little bit of excitement, if you can sense a little bit of joy, if you can sense a little bit of pep in my speech this morning, it's because we are approaching the greatest, the most liberating, the most exciting passages in all of the Bible, friends. If you can get this down in your spirit, you will walk in a manner of freedom in exhilarating joy before your Lord each and every day. You will walk in a newness of spirit that maybe you have never experienced before, but is available to all of God's children, all the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we must not only understand this intellectually, it must find a resting place in our souls. And so as we approach this chapter, Romans chapter 6 today, I want you to think back on what the context of this letter is. Paul is writing to Jewish believers, young believers, new believers, that are coming out of the burden and the bondage that the Jewish faith has placed upon them throughout their entire lives. And now they are understanding and beginning to comprehend that they no longer live by the letter of the law, but they live by the liberty of the Spirit. And Paul has laid a very detailed argument between the law and grace, identifying that now God Jehovah has done what he has always promised. He has opened the way unto all people. And so it doesn't matter if you're bond or free. It doesn't matter if you're a barbarian. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew. And it doesn't matter if you're a Gentile. The way has been made open to all. It's available to all who will simply come and surrender to both the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ and the horrible sacrifice he made of himself upon that old rugged cross. And so Paul, in making the argument of where sin abounds, grace even abounds more, doesn't mean that we continue to sin so that grace will abound because we are dead to sin. Just as Jesus hung his head and died and went low into the grave, three days later was resurrected with glory and power, so too we, when we bow at the cross, we place ourselves in an empty grave. And having died there, we are now resurrected with glory and power, and we now walk in a newness of life. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. And that's where we pick up in chapter 6 today. So if you have your Bible, turn to chapter 6, verse 1. Paul begins by saying, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 34 that we are to awake to righteousness. What does that mean, awake to righteousness? Because we died. We placed ourselves in an empty tomb. And as we are resurrected from that tomb with the same resurrection power that Jesus came out of that tomb, let us awake to righteousness, pursuing the things of God and sin not. Back to Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Do you not know that all of us that were baptized into Jesus Christ, who have been submerged in the work of Jesus Christ, in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, in surrender to Jesus the Christ, we were baptized into his death. We became one with him when we died. And just as we were buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. 
For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, which we have, if we've truly been born again, if we've truly made surrender unto him, then we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Think about that, friends. Let that sink into your spirit. Whom do you think Jesus is? Who do you think he was when he came out of that grave? How much different than the man who walked just days before upon the earth? What glory and majesty and power and light and truth infilled his body in those moments? Well, friends, you are being told here in this text that that is the same exact power that you and I are to walk in. And if you can get this, if you can understand this, your life will be one of victory. The same victory that Jesus now lives in. Because Jesus, the resurrected Holy One, now resides within us. In verse 5, if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, so shall we also not be in the likeness of his resurrection? Knowing this, that our old man, that person we were who was given unto his own desires before we surrendered to the Lord, that old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, annihilated, no longer having any power whatsoever. Something that is dead is absolutely inanimate, friends. It is lifeless. And our old man, we are being told, is dead. He is lifeless. So if we sin, stand not upon the old adage that, well, we're all human and we're going to sin. That's not what this text says. This text says you have been delivered from sin, you are dead to sin, and you should live no longer therein. And so if you and I sin, it's only because we resurrect the old man. We allow the old man to have opportunity to have new life. But if we keep him in the grave, dead where he belongs, under the authority and the power of Jesus who resides within us, the old man is dead. Sin has been destroyed. And henceforth, we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Get that picture, friends. It's like a man who has been locked in a dungeon for years and years and years, and yet he is set free. Do you think that he would ever want to return to that dungeon? Do you think that he would ever even consider the bondage that he was once in, now that he is freed, to go back? Do you think he would ever want to wear those shackles again and to be under the oppression of one who has oppressed him for so long? Of course not. And that's what Paul is saying. Neither should we, friends. For in verse 8, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we will live with him, not just in the age to come, but now. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dies no more. Death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. So should you, friends. So should I. We don't live under the old master any longer. We live under a new master, the God whom we serve. And when we rise each morning, we bow in humble surrender before him, seek his will, and do everything in our power to observe his will. So reckon yourselves to be dead unto sin. Let this sink deep within your mind. Let this become your number one objective, that you are dead to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God, unto his law, unto his rule, unto his commands, as those that are alive from the dead. You no longer serve the same master. You're under a new master. And so live your life like it. And your members, which is speaking of your body, your body as an instrument of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. You are not under the law, but you are under grace. Well, because we're now under grace, 
Shall we then say and shall we then continue to sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are. To whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But let the Almighty One be praised that you were once servants of sin, but now you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, the teachings of the Lord Jesus, and you have been made free from sin. You have become the servants or the slaves of righteousness. For as you once yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. Live a disciplined life. Be a man in your faith. Be a woman in your faith and quit acting like children. Live disciplined lives. For you were the servants of sin under the control of the sin. You were free from righteousness. You didn't answer righteousness. God wasn't your master. And what was the result of the things you once did which you now are ashamed of? Knowing that the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and having become servants, slaves to the living God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For we know that the wages of sin, the payment of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Oh, friends, are you excited? Do you feel the power in that chapter? There is very little need of commentary within that chapter because it clearly explains itself. The problem is, is that so often we want to continue to offer excuse for the way that we live, the choices that we make. But one cannot argue with this chapter, friends. It is so clearly laid out. As we are told time and time again throughout the chapter, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Let us therefore walk in newness of life, having the old man crucified with Jesus, that we should not serve sin, because he who is dead to sin is freed from sin. Reckon ye yourselves to be dead unto sin. Let not sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it. And do not yield your members, your body, as an instrument of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves, surrender yourselves unto God, so that you being alive from the dead, resurrected from the grave, that your body would become an instrument of righteousness unto God. And being made free from sin, become a servant of righteousness surrendering your body as a servant to righteousness, which will lead to holiness and godliness through a disciplined life, knowing by doing so that the gift of God that will be offered unto you in this life and in the life to come is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And what is eternal life? John seventeen three. Jesus said eternal life is to know God the Father, and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom He has sent. Do you truly know Him in your heart, friend? Not an intellectual acknowledgement of who He is, but have you fully surrendered to the Lord Jesus? Is He the ruler of your life? Does He sit upon the throne of your life? Is He your King? And in every breath you take upon this earth, is your ultimate desire, your one goal to bring him pleasure in each and everything that you do, each and everything that you say, each and everything that you think. Are you fully surrendered to him, friends? Is he truly your God and your king? Well, I trust that he is. And if he is not, I pray that this is the day that you will make him truly Lord, Master, of your life. Well, I love you, friends. I'm so grateful, so thankful 
that you are again with us this morning, sitting under the tutelage of the Holy Spirit through his precious word, and that your life is being conformed into the servant of righteousness that he so desires, so longs for you to become. Now, as he wills and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.